for the opportunity. So, as many of you will know, I'm a new addition to California. I've only been here for seven months. I'm still trying to understand the weather. I'm just away in the way. Uh, so, uh, uh, never. Uh, so, anyway, so I, so I wanted to talk about, uh, I wanted to give a little bit about what we're doing in UCSD, and then I wanted to go and talk about what I truly have problems in the world. Uh, so, um, so, of course, I came out here to run the, the new uh, Institute for Contextual Robotics and trying to really understand what can we do in terms of solving real-world robotic systems. How can we build real systems? How can we deploy them in the real world uh, so that we're not only solving sort of um, academic problems, but also problems that people really care about. Uh, so we do a number of different things. So we come sort of from a world where we think about the static world, we've gone into a world where we do uh, sort of mobile devices, and we do this, and of course, to us, the, the really interesting problems are really what happens when we can do massive amounts of data in mobile devices in a highly dynamic world. Uh, so we're thinking about this primarily in terms of three different application areas, in terms of what can we do to build truly autonomous systems, uh, what can we do to build systems that would assist people in daily lives, uh, so in terms of autonomy, really figuring out how do we do this so that we have robust autonomy. And robust, uh, robust autonomy to me is how do we handle unmodeled events in a robust fashion so that we can do this. We have a bunch of people that are, that are, that are doing this, uh, so I'm just putting this up quickly before I want to get to the, the hard problems. So trying to really work on how do we do autonomy with people working in sort of the same spaces. Uh, the other is to figure out how do we build sort of what Mario was talking about earlier on, how do we build sort of robots for homes? So, so one of the missions that I'm very interested in is, would I be able to build a robot for an elderly person that would allow them to stay another five years in their home? This is sort of an interesting sort of challenge to put out there. If you could do this, the average person would save $60,000 a year, so you can not just buy robots, you can actually buy something that would have the cost, the equivalent cost of a small car. Uh, and now, if I go to Dennis, we can talk about real robots, you know, and, and, and if I give him the cost of a real car, you know, then will this be really cool? So the question is, how can we do this, and, and, and what is the, the logistics for doing this? Uh, so we have a bunch of people that are working on doing this across different areas. This is on the center, and some of them. But given that we are new robotics institute, one of the things that we were very interested in was to figure out what are truly hard problems. So I'm, one of the things that I'm probably most well known for is that I wrote the, I edited the, the National Robotics Roadmap that created the National Robotics Institute. Uh, and one of the things that I'm very famous for is that I presented this roadmap, the last version of the roadmap, on November 7th. And I did a briefing to party to the uh, Hillary transition team, and that was a complete waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know that, you know, I, at least, uh, I said all along as we wrote this, I had two different introductions. I had one for Trump and I had one for Hillary. And November 7th, I said, I think I know what introduction I'm putting in. I put in the wrong introduction. <laughs> <laughs> but, but given that we've done this, the roadmap is very much about trying to sort of extrapolate where do we think robotics is going to go the next five, ten years down the road. Uh, we've done the roadmap uh, 2009, uh, 2013, and then the 2017. And whenever we do the next version, we go back and check did we really, how good were we at predicting what the world is going to look like five years later? Uh, and generally, we've been very good at doing these predictions. For from here to there, one of the predictions we did not have right was we didn't predict the Kinect RDBD sensor, uh, and uh, we didn't really sort of predict how popular drones would be by 2013. So it really sort of took up, and, and then if we came to, to this one, we didn't really sort of estimate how popular deep learning would be. Everybody is totally gaga about deep learning and well, now we haven't really predicted that would happen. And we didn't really predict how far the industry would predict we would be about autonomous driving cars. So everybody is saying we'll get autonomous driving cars 2022. I don't think we will, but uh, uh, the industry will at least spend a lot of money on that. Uh, so what I wanted to know is what are really hard problems? And if you know about mathematics, then you'll know about 1900, David Hilbert proposed 23 problems in robotics that sort of shape, in, in mathematics, that shape sort of 
uh, math for another hundred years, so I wanted to know what are the equivalent set of problems in, in robotics that you think could really sort of shape the future. So I invited a bunch of very famous people, this is a subset of them, uh, some, many of them are in the room, uh, to come to San Diego late February uh, and hang out with good food in a nice restaurant. Uh, it was not hard to get them to come. Uh, so, so we had a couple of really fun days uh, to try and think about what, what, what are the truly hard problems. I'll brief you. So here are some, I had the question from sending white papers, and here's sort of a word cloud of what came out of it. So clearly manipulation is still a hard problem. Uh, real time, perception, learning, intuition, and also human interaction were some of the words that, that sort of came out to this. Um, and one of the things, one of the, the big things that actually not such a big word here is grasping is still a really, really hard problem. And, and one of the reasons why grasping is a really hard problem that will come up is that we still don't have very good skin. So we still have, you know, we're lousy at doing sort of perception. So I want to show you a very simple example here, and some of you will have seen this before. This is a young lady that, uh, from Royal Nuance and stuff, that was asked to light a match. And takes, as you can see, you can't see because of the bad vehicle, it takes about six seconds. Then we uh, took this young lady and we anesthetized her tactile nerves so that she no longer has any fingertip sense left, but she still has full motor control and everything, but the only thing she doesn't have is tactile feedback. Uh, and then we asked her to light the match again. And when this was done, I was still a vision researcher, and I said, yeah, tactile, it's overrated, you know. With vision, you can do all of this. And uh, so we let her do lighting the match in. And um, I also had that behavior after a significant number of years. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so it takes her 27 seconds. So a very significant amount of time. So it's very important for us to think about how do we actually integrate different sensory modalities to be able to do this really well. So one of our conclusions was clearly to figure out how do we get human-like robotic skin that has tactile and that has all of this, which really requires sensing people, uh, materials people to all come together and do this. Another challenge we sort of put up, what if you could do a printer or compiler that would allow you to autonomously build things at multiple scales. If we had this, Amazon would be replaced by UPS. That would imply that I could now freely print most materials in the back of a UPS truck. So when Dennis orders his next gadget, you know, I can say, I'll print it on the way out to you so you can get just in time. Uh, Dennis will probably buy one. But, you know, it would be very nice. The other is that if you still look in, in the materials domain, what would it look like if we could have sort of a swarm, and when I talk about swarms, a large enough set of robots that would be capable of moving significant distances. So what if we go away from traditional actuation mechanisms to really think about sort of truly distributed that would be able to move extended distances? It could be for, uh, for medicine, it could be for other things. What if we could make materials that could actually grow? I would still like to have this, if you think about it, I would like to have a hand with tactile sensing that could organically grow. So when I'm at home and I'm trying to do my own sort of housework and hit myself on the finger, I can regrow my material over time, that would be really cool. Uh, so one of the other things, so, so how, how would we be able to get to sort of this future where we can really do this? Uh, we're, we're nowhere close. So the other thing we looked at is, you know, what if we could build a robot that would have the performance of an animal? And not you can, you know, today we can sort of find very, very specific tasks. But we can't really get to a place where we can do it in a, in a manner where you can sort of say, it's good enough. So I think it was Maya that was saying earlier on, you know, what if, if we start looking at these robots, they sort of look like a person, but they're really <coughs> creepy and they don't have the same behavior, what would that take? Uh, but we're starting to see actually where you can have free printed, so buildings printed but they don't have all the plumbing and all of the infrastructure. So I want to be able to print the house that Mario showed earlier uh, and do it overnight. Uh, so uh, that would be cool if we could build robots that do this. What swarm would it take to be able to do this? The other is to sort of think about, could we 
uh, and actually do some environmental monitoring in a, in a, in a very targeted way. So one of the things we came up with is that could you imagine that uh, we would be able to do environmental monitoring anywhere on the world, any time of the day, uh, using a formal robot? So it would have to require some swimming, some walking, some flying. What would that take? Um, for, on the assistive side, we would like to have a long-term robotic helper. So if I come back to my, my challenge of can I build a robot that would operate for my eight-year-old mother for five years without having a five roboticists living in her house? Uh, you know, so, so what would that take for, for me to be able to do this so that you can do this for everyday situations? It's okay that it costs $30,000, but it has to be reliable enough. So if we could do this, that would be cool. Uh, can we build robots that could physically assist people? I'm giving you a challenge. So when I grow old, I would like to have a robot that would help me go to the restroom. I don't have a robot today that I would want to go to the restroom with me. Trust me, there are certain parts that you know I'm going to be very careful about not letting loose on a robot. So you know, we need to figure out how can we actually do this so that we can physically assist people so that it's actually good enough. Uh, and then, of course, you know, how do we do some acceptable, intuitive engaging of robots for, for doing this? I would claim most of us do not carefully think about robot design. We build robots that look really cool. You can publish a paper in April. But from a design point of view, you know, if I go home and present it to my family, they look at me and say, really? You know? So we, we need to be able to do, we need to start thinking sort of much more holistically about this so that we can do this. Uh, so I want to build you know, a robot like this that I can actually use. It could be autonomous, but it could also do it on its own. Uh, and it has to be so that you can actually operate it for five years with this. That's sort of where the challenge is. Uh, finally, uh, I want to talk about the environmental monitoring. One of the interesting things that sort of came out is that if you go back and actually, there is a, there is a slide out here about using cell phone towers for being able to do localization. One of the interesting aspects of, of this is that with the new 5G, uh, you can potentially <coughs> send, you send out six different frequencies. And if you're in any one place, so, and, and we'll hear later on you know, from, from Jasmine about what if we get these massive sort of frequency spectrum, we can potentially use this to do slam. So I can stand here and I can walk around on the scene and I can detect where the cell phone towers are, but I can also detect all the materials in between. So what if I could have a robot and the only thing it had on board was a radio receiver and it could actually do slam? That's a really cool challenge to figure out how would we do this. So, so Jasmine, that was... Uh, uh, you know, so, and of course, the other thing, if we don't look at everybody's you know, very interested in doing machine learning, how can we get to a place where you will automatically learn your intermediate representations? So you don't have to, you know, today I would sort of say it's an art form to figure out what the architecture is for your next deep learning network. It should figure it out on its own. How do we come up with an algorithm that would be able to do this? And how can we design systems, you know, where you have a specified sort of level of, of, of accuracy and safety that would be able to do this. So if we could do this, um, uh, the, uh, so I'll skip this one. Uh, so uh, so if we can do this, that would be really cool. We're writing up this in a paper of 30 people that was at this workshop, and it will come out uh, sometime this summer. Uh, and right now we're trying to get, so we'll, there's a lot more details behind this. I didn't have time in 15 minutes to talk about all the details. Uh, and we're trying to see if we can make it sort of a grand challenge. So there will be 20 grand challenges, and the first one that solves it, it would be like the X-Prize. The first one that solves one of those, there will be a million dollars to it. So we'll try and see if we can crowdsource solutions to this. Uh, but with that, I should stop, and then Jasmine can talk about RF or RF transmission. Thanks.